So it's true, I do have a social media influence, and much more than that, and I'm grateful to be on this stage today, because as Doug just brilliantly put it, this is much bigger than just us in this room. This is a, a worldwide movement, 7.5 billion people or so. Everybody needs this information, because a lot of what we've been taught it's the complete opposite of what's going to get us well. If you've ever been affected by heart disease or cancer in your life, please stand up right now. If you know somebody or if you've ever been affected by cancer or heart disease, please stand up and stay standing, please. Look around. Look around to this room. Look at everybody standing up. There's probably 90% of the people in here have stood up. So my question is, when is enough enough? You could sit down. Here are the stats. One out of three women are diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. One out of two men. 60% of Americans plus are diabetic or pre-diabetic. Look at this stat right here on the right. It's predicted by 2032, which is not too far away, one in two children will be born on the autism spectrum. Are you kidding me? How could we even have a world that functions? Because either we're going to be autistic or we're going to be taking care of somebody who's autistic. We won't have a police force. We won't have an army. We would have complete chaos. And that's the direction that things are going. But we are going to put a stand in that, and that's what this weekend's about. If you look at diabetes, which is the focus of my talk today, one out of six people, or excuse me, every six seconds, we have somebody dying from the complications of diabetes. And this is from 2013. It's gotten worse. This stat right here is a stat that I like to start my lectures with, because that's how many people, on average, die every single day. Yesterday, 150,000 people took their last breath in the world. Today, 150,000 people are going to struggle to take their last breath. So I want to start right here. I want everybody to put their right hand on their heart. Let's take a deep breath in. Exhale. One more time. Deep breath in. Exhale. You feel the heart beating? Just the fact that your heart is beating, you're in front of me right now, you're looking at me, you're alive, that's something to be grateful for. Gratitude and love will get you really far in life. So whenever you find yourself stressed out, maybe you have a loved one who's going through something, you're stuck in traffic, whatever it is, think of this number right here, 150,000, it's gonna immediately shift you into gratitude. It's going to put you in a new perspective. I want to acknowledge Pam and Doug. Let's give them a big round of applause here. And the entire team, we have the tech team, everybody who has put this event on, and every single one of you, because we're in beautiful, beautiful Miami, or South Florida, I'm from Miami, but we're in beautiful South Florida. You could be at the beach, you could be at wherever you want to be, but you're here today because you are taking ownership over your health, over your family's health, over your community, and that's what this is about. So I acknowledge all of you in here right now and also the live streamers who are watching. So disclosures, I'm the founder of Keto Camp. That is my company. I teach how to follow a ketogenic, low-carb, high-fat approach, and I also teach detoxification protocols, uh, and I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, practitioner, so I'm a certified health coach with them. Here is a little bit more about me if you're new to my information. Uh, I, have, I have three best-selling books. I'm the host of a top 15 podcast called the Keto Camp Podcast. Uh, we are rated top 15 in alternative health in the U.S. And I started my YouTube channel last December, so December of 2018. And the first 12 months, we hit 65,000 subscribers. Our goal at Keto Camp this year for the YouTube channel is to get 1 million subscribers. And the significance of that, it's not yeah, we're cool, we have a million subscribers. No, it's one million people will get this information. The information I'm going to share with you is aligned with everything that you're going to hear this weekend, everything that Doug teaches and all the incredible speakers here. 
That is the significance of that. And we could speak louder and we could drown out all the bad information that's being regurgitated and accepted as truth. This is who I used to be. First 24 years of my life, I was obese. My parents, who immigrated here from Iran in the 1970s, did the best they can with what they had. My mom learned, Sesame, uh, learned English through Sesame Street. She worked three jobs. One of those jobs was an assistant manager at Kentucky Fried Chicken. And she would bring me home every single night, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And being a kid, I ate that Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> And my parents got divorced as I was growing up, so my mom, um, my superhero, superwoman, I love her so much, she worked three jobs to raise me and my sister. And one of those, as I mentioned, was Kentucky Fried Chicken. And she was never home because she was working, so I was left to my own devices. Kentucky Fried Chicken, video games, drugs, gang members I was hanging out with, and my physical appearance, appearance showed because growing up, I was the bullied kid. I was the kid who never took off his shirt being in Miami. I wore my shirts inside of swimming pools at the beach. Bullied, picked on, and I put depressed. But you know, underneath that, there was a point in my life. This is when I was 24 years old here, 2008, to put it in reference. I was at a rock bottom in my life. My ex-girlfriend broke up with me. Working at a pa I was working at a packing and shipping store. All I cared about was my video game stats. Call of Duty, Madden, I was just all into that, not about my health or my girlfriend. So she left me, and this is me. At 24 years old, I was so devastated by the loss of my girlfriend, unhealthy both physically and mentally. I was also mentally obese. I didn't know how to handle it. I was afraid to be in a room by myself, because every time I was, I would go on the internet to look for ways to kill myself. I was tired of being in pain. I was crying every single day. And every time I, I went to, on the internet, I would think about my mom and what I would leave behind for her, and it stopped me in my tracks. But this is a pinnacle moment in my life, and if you've ever hit rock bottom, everybody's rock bottom is different, but you could relate. I knew that I had to do something. I was tired of being buried in the dirt. I was tired of just everything. I was blaming everyone and everything and my genetics. This is the time of my life that books entered my life. Wayne Dyer, Bob Proctor, these amazing authors, I just shifted my mind. And at this point in my life is when I actually took ownership over my health. I said, I am responsible. Not the Kentucky Fried Chicken, not the government guidelines, not any of the things I was blaming. Because I was being, I, before this point, I was being a victim of my past. And I decided I'm going to be a victor of my future. And I took full responsibility. I said it. I am responsible. You want to know what happened nine months from that moment? I went from 250 pounds to 170 pounds, 34% body fat, 6% body fat, size 38 waist to size 30 waist. And I finally achieved a physical six-pack, which for me was a big deal at the time. Not that that is related to true health. But you know what happened? I carved out a mental six-pack. I'll take that over a physical six-pack any day of the week. That's where my life shifted. That's where I started to become a personal trainer. That's where I became the owner of a CrossFit gym. That's where I started to study health. But I treated it as a hobby. And many of you in here might be doing the same thing. You're treating this kind of as a hobby. It's, I'm kind of interested in it. But my true purpose was revealed to me here, and this is going to be hopefully impactful for you here. This is my dad. His name is Sirus Azadi. He decided to come to America from Iran and change my life altogether. And he had type 2 diabetes, which we all know it's a lifestyle disease. And I remember as a kid, watching him take his medication, take his insulin. And as I got older, I would, take, I would drive my dad to his doctor's appointments. They would prescribe him his insulin. He kept getting bigger. And I remember one of the appointments, I was taking my dad to his doctor's appointment, and they said, hey, your dad need, needs to lose some weight to help with the diabetes. And here's his insulin. And I said, doesn't insulin cause him to gain weight? And they, they, they told me, that's just the way it goes. 
But back then, I was not a free thinker. I was not awake. So I accepted that, took them to Publix, which is a local grocery store in Florida, and I bought him all the food they told me to buy for him. Make sure he had some Krispy Kreme donuts in case his blood sugar gets low. <laughs> that was advice, right? But I didn't, I didn't know any better back then. I was not awake. So I watched year after year my dad get worse. And it was in 2013, going into 2014, where he called me and he said that he couldn't even walk to the bathroom. He had really bad di diabetic neuropathy. The nerves of his feet were just degenerating. Couldn't even get up to go to the bathroom. So me and my mom, we drove him to the emergency room in Mount Sinai in Miami Beach. And he was so stressed out in the hospital because he, he knew that the next step, if you don't take care of this, they're going to amputate one of his legs, both of his legs, because he was going to go gangrene there. Knowing that in the hospital, he suffered a massive stroke that left him paralyzed and he lost the ability to speak. They transferred him to a hospice facility. And week after week, I visited my dad as I watched his body shrink before my eyes. I watched the life get sucked out of him. Couldn't even, he couldn't even say a word to me. I, 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 he could look at me and I could see how badly he wanted to communicate to me. He would say some words to me, but I didn't know what he was saying. For nine months, I watched this happen. And every single night, I came home and I prayed. I prayed, I prayed. And then it was August 12, 2014. It was a Monday night where I went to go visit my dad. And he was in the worst shape ever. If you've ever dealt with something like this, it's just not something I wish on anybody. He was throwing up on himself. He was convulsing. He was hopeless. It was such a bad sight to see. And the nurses cleaned him up. He looked a lot better. I walked up to him at the end of the night, and, and I looked at him, and I told him how much I loved him. I, I kissed him on the forehead, and I, and I said something to him that he always used to say to me growing up from the movie Terminator, which was, hasta la vista, baby. And I, and I kissed him on the forehead, and I told him I loved him. I'm always going to be his son. He's always going to be my father. And I went home that night, and I said the same prayer that I said every single night, which was, please end my father's suffering. He has suffered enough. Went to bed that night. The next day, 12 p.m., I get a phone call from the hospital. I see it's from the hospital, and my heart just, just sinks in my chest, and pick it up, shaking, and they inform me that my dad stopped breathing that morning, and they couldn't bring him back. And, and with that, I sat down on my couch, just crying, waves of emotions. I was happy that my dad is no longer in pain, no longer suffering. I no longer have to see that. And I was so devastated that my one and only father is no longer with me. And this is the moment of my life that I set out to figure out what happened to my dad. What's happening to this world? What's happening to this country? I gave you the stats, and I have done tremendous amounts of research since then, and I have figured out, and I know that this information that I'm going to share with you today, the information that I share on my social media, it's the same information that would have saved my father's life. I know that. I would have reversed it with him. I would have helped take care of the root cause of his issue, but I also know that I was given that mountain so I could show the world that this mountain can be moved. This was a lifestyle disease that was treated with medication. Huge mismatch right there. So this is the information that's going to make a big difference for you if you know somebody who's going through this, type 2 diabetes. This is the information that could be life-changing for them. All the information you're going to hear from brilliant speakers this weekend this is the information that you share to your community. You do what Doug says. You sign up for the forums. You spread this like wildfire because if we don't, we are doomed for those stats that I showed you. My favorite quote comes from Einstein. Intellectuals solve problems. Geniuses prevent them. Would you agree that the way they treat the standard treatment of diabetes is uh, solving a problem and looking at the symptom? So what I'm saying here is let's be proactive, not reactive. 
Let's be geniuses. Every single one of you in here, you're here and you're a genius because you are being proactive. But it's not the norm, and it should be. How many of you know this guy? So here's, I'm going to give you an analogy that I got from one of my mentors, Dr. Jason Fung, which I'm sure I imagine all of you know Dr. Fung. If you don't know this guy, he is George Costanza, who was a character on the popular TV show, the sitcom nine, uh, in the 90s, Seinfeld. There was an episode on Seinfeld where George Costanza, who was getting terrible results in his life, decided, I'm going to do everything opposite of what I had been doing up until this point. So he would see a girl at the bar and say, hey, I'm George Costanza. I'm broke. I live with my mom. Nice to meet you. And she'd say, come sit next to me. <laughs> so he started doing everything opposite. He started ordering food differently. And what happened in his life? Everything improved. His relationships, his finances. So what I'm going to say here and what I'm going to teach and what everybody's teaching this weekend, it's very different than what the mainstream media talks about, right? So look at what the government guidelines are promoting. Look at what mainstream media is talking about and do the opposite, the George Costanza effect, and you're probably going to be going down the right direction because sometimes when you follow the masses, the M is silent. <laughs> and be careful when you follow the sheep because you might just step in shit. So you got, we got to be our own health detective here, and I know that you understand that, and I just want to get that message around uh, in a funny way, in a comical way.